Hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Disability Identification, Assessment and Determination in Social Protection Systems, Barriers to Access and Gateways to Support. This is webinar number three in the series, Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Social Protection for COVID-19 Recovery and Beyond. To begin with, I would like to pay my respects to the first Australians past and present, to the Ngunnawal people, on whose traditional lands I am speaking to you from, day, from today, which was never conceded and thank them for their persistence and patience. My name is Felicity O'Brien and I work in the social protection section in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I'll be your moderator for the discussion again tonight. Um, tonight we will also have two sign language interpreters signing in international sign language Along the bottom of the screen, you will also see live captioning of the discussions. You can click on the bottom of your screen and to ensure that your captions are visible, you can see the closed caption option on the right hand side of the bottom of the screen and just click on that to make sure that your captions are visible. If you would also like to pin the interpreter, we will be spotlighting them for the discussion tonight. But if you do want to pin them, if you hover over the left hand side of the screen where the interpreter is, um, there's three little dots and if you left click on that, then you can choose pin video and that will make sure that the interpreters are pinned for the entire discussion. Um, we'll be recording the webinar tonight, which will include a full transcript and the slides, and this will be going up on the socialprotection.org website in the following days. I'll also be pausing tonight between each guest speaker and um, we'll try and have a, a question and answer session after each speaker. So please, during the discussions tonight, um, you'll see the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen too, next to the closed caption option. Please um, send your questions through while the speakers are talking and we can either answer your questions live or come back to them at the end of each speaker. We'll also have another Q&A session at the end of um, the webinar tonight. So this webinar is the third in a series of three disability inclusion and social protection technical webinars that we've been holding over the past months. Um, the objective of tonight's webinar is to provide an overall framework on how disability assessment and determination can be undertaken in lower and middle income countries in ways that are accessible by all persons with disabilities and also adapted to the country and human resources context, but also still compliant with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability. Um, you can also find the webinar recordings from the other two um, webinars that we've held. Um, one was on assessment and one was on um, COVID recovery and response. They were held on the 29th and the 30th of October, and you can find them on the socialprotection.org website. If you also join up on the socialprotection.org um, newsletter, um, you can join further discussions on the impact of COVID-19 on social protection issues more generally. And um, that way you can also collaborate and keep updated about future webinars. So introducing the dynamics and the speakers for tonight. So we have a very exciting panel of speakers for you, which um, I will introduce shortly. Um, but I'll quickly go over the format for tonight. Um, we will first have an overview and introductory presentation on um, assessment and determination mechanisms. We will then go to Fiji for a case study on collaboration between um, DPOs and government to create an assessment and determination system. We will have a case study from Georgia about ongoing reforms of a long existing system. And then we will cross over to Laos for a case study on the community-based inclusive development modular tool, experience using that and assessment contributing to community-based rehabilitation, case management and digitization of um, assessment um, information. So introducing our guest speakers tonight, our star lineup, we have Alex Coates from the UNPRPD ILO UNICEF Inclusive Social Protection Program. So Alex is the co-founder of the Centre for Inclusive Policy and participated in the negotiation of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Currently he's involved in coordination of the joint UNPRPD ILO UNICEF Inclusive Social Protection Program. We have Josh Wakanayasi from Fiji. He's the president of the Fiji Federation of Persons with a Disability after a career in the 
corporate sector, Josh joined the disability sector, focusing on improving the lives of people living with spinal injury and physical impairment. He has led the development of, of a mobility device service and economic empowerment programs in Fiji. Josh was also a key promoter and architect of the Universal Disability Allowance, which is a, was adopted in Fiji in 2018. We have um, Ketavan Melikadze, who is the Social Welfare Officer for UNICEF in Georgia. Um, Ketavan has been working to support the government to develop systems and services to protect the most vulnerable children, including children with a disability, reforming disability assessment and determination mechanisms so that they are in line with um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability Standards. She is also the UNICEF focal point for disability issues. And then tonight, our final speaker will be Donna Cormes, who is the Senior Technical Advisor with USAID OCARD Project in Laos. She's the Senior Technical Advisor at World Education and has 25 years experience as a disability researcher, technical advisor, and worked as an occupational therapist in Africa, the Caribbean and Asia. Her role in Laos focuses on need assessment and case management as part of community-based um, inclusive development systems. So as I said, we encourage you all um, as the audience to send questions to our panelists throughout the webinar. Please use the Q&A function and we will try our best to address all the questions um, as we go along through the webinar tonight. If there are any outstanding questions at the end, we will prepare a written document that will be shared with the published webinar when it goes up on the website um, over the following days. So tonight we will hear from our speakers about what they are seeing on the ground with regards to identification, assessment and determination systems to ensuring the full inclusion of persons with disability in social protection and other essential services. We'll see how these systems can align with um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability and also take a person-centred approach. Inclusive social protection is an essential element to safeguarding the full and dignified and the real participation of persons with disability globally in the social and economic life of their communities. So without further ado, I would like to pass over to our first speaker, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much, Felicity, for, for this introduction and, and welcome to all of you for this very important uh, webinar. I, I say very important because in the series of webinar and interaction we had, this is probably one of the most critical uh, issue and certainly the most challenging for, for government and organization of persons with disabilities uh, alike. So in the previous um, webinars, we um, basically explained what would be expected from an inclusive social protection system across the life cycle, providing for basic income security, coverage of healthcare costs, uh, including rehabilitation and assistive device, coverage of disability related costs, including access to support services and facilitating access to early childhood development, education and economic empowerment program. And we saw that to achieve um, such, uh, such feature, um, there would be a need to combine in-kind and in-cash support across the life cycle. And um, this can take the form of cash transfer, concession, uh, cash allowance, direct delivery of, of services. And one of the key issues for government is who gets what? How do I decide who is first officially a person with disability so that I can uh, sort out um, who, who should receive which services. And of course, there is also the issue of resource allocation. And all this go through the eligibility determination process. The specifics for persons with disabilities is that when it comes to disability specific support, often there will be the requirement of an official uh, disability assessment and determination process. So, from the interaction with, um, with uh, colleagues uh, at the country level, what we have seen is there is three main situations. The first one is what we will call basic identification. Uh, basic identification 
uh, with regards to um, identifying households which are likely to have persons with disabilities. Um, this is, for instance, done for data disaggregation purpose, or in the case where you have schemes where disability might be uh, uh, household vulnerability criteria. Mm, this is the case in many sub-Saharan Africa uh, countries where you would have uh, disability, old age, or other type of, of issues as one criteria for eligibility in the, in the cash transfer. And, um, or, for instance, as we saw during COVID, we need uh, rapid expansion. And then there are those assessment surveys that are done with households. How do we make sure that we capture households where it's likely that there is a person with disabilities? Um, it's not, there is no straightforward answer. The, the tool that is the most commonly used or more and more used is actually the Washington Group uh, short set. We recommend to actually use the Washington Group hand hands set, which is the Washington Group six questions plus few more that would capture uh, the better, for instance, psychosocial uh, issues. The short set was really meant to be the, the minimum to put in a census or, or an household survey for statistical purpose. In, in this configuration, we advise to have the unanswered set, which is 10 to 12 questions. Um, but if you want to do um, an assessment for granting an official disability status, you cannot use the Washington Group short set or the Washington Group unanswered set. You need to use a, a dedicated uh, tool and instrument for individual disability assessment. And this is really something that the Washington Group itself has insisted on the, the Washington Group set of questions was not designed to do individual disability assessment. It's, not, it's a blunt instrument for statistical purpose and it does its job well. It can be used to identify households that, that are likely to have persons with disabilities, but it's not an off-the-shelf tool to do individual disability assessment. And the same goes if you do uh, assessment and determination for eligibility for specific um, benefits. So many countries are actually embarking in reforming the system. And one of the reasons for that is that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Committee um, is actually recommending systematically to countries to evolve uh, their system of disability assessment and determination so that it incorporates a human rights model of disability. To date, the CRPD committee has given indication of what that means, but there is not yet a full guidance on what exactly that would entail. So what we want to do now is just presenting few elements that came repeatedly uh, from the CRPD committee. First, having um, uh, an assessment that focus on the requirement of the person because of the barrier within the society rather than solely the impairment. Second, the process of accessing disability or equal opportunity card or disability certification should be accessible, simple and free of charge for all persons with disability over the national territory. Organization of persons with disability should be involved in the design of the assessment mechanism. We should eliminate multiple methods of assessment or multiple assessments which are burdening applicants and persons with disability, and this should be consistent and transparent. Information on assessment requirements should be accessible and user-friendly. It should not solely be based on medical certificate or medical assessment. And it should avoid a focus on incapacity to work, inability to perform social roles. A, a, a fundamental element, uh, and it's really relevant for social protection, is moving away from this focus on incapacity to work. While it is extremely critical to acknowledge all the barriers that are faced by persons with disabilities in uh, accessing employment and work, it is important to shift from being a person that intrinsically cannot work to uh, ass assessing or viewing person with disability as 
one person that may not be in position to work due to barrier and the lack of support in the environment. And the key question is what is needed for persons to achieve basic participation on equal basis with others. Disability assessment and determination is extremely critical and often we tend to focus on the tool, while actually the political economy of the reform is extremely important. Why? Because for persons with disabilities, it's the gatekeeper. Uh, you get the support or you don't get the support. For policymaker, it's the tool for, for, for targeting, of course, and for resource allocation. And we know that in many low and middle income countries where data are still scarce, there is this kind of unknown. If we create a disability allowance, how many persons will, will uptake? How many persons will be there to, 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 to request it? So this, this unknown is a, a source of uncertainty that, that is critical for policymakers. And for organization of persons with disabilities, it's also the gatekeepers for their members to access support. And reforming a disability assessment and determination is not an easy fit because many organizations of persons with disability will fear that actually their member will lose out. And they don't really understand what will be the outcome of the system. So we are a kind of odd equation. beyond impairment and consider support required for participation but also from a government point of view it has to be reliable with low risk of fraud and high consistency for person with disabilities it has to be predictable you don't embark in a disability assessment that is sometimes dignified always difficult without knowing at all what would be the outcome and it should contribute to case management and policy planning one thing that is extremely important from the beginning is to unbundle some of the key concepts. Very often, when people say, oh, there is a disability assessment pro pro problem, they actually refer to disability determination. And those two need to be uh, distinguished, at least conceptually. The disability assessment is the question, the information gathering about the situation of the person. The disability determination is the actual official decision based on a set of criteria and the information captured during the assessment. For instance, you can have the same assessment. Let's say I have in the assessment a, a score of 70. Um, and the disability determination say you are a person with significant disability if you are above 75 of score. But next year, there will be a reform and the determination will say you are a person with significant disability if you are above 55 of score or 65 of score. I didn't change the assessment. My score didn't change, but one day from one day to another, I became a person with significant disability for the purpose of disability determination. So it's important to distinguish those two. All the information you capture during disability assessment may not have to be used for disability determination, but can be used to inform policy to inform eligibility determination and case management. In many countries today, you have a kind of puzzle and maze with many different assessments. Depend each ministry providing something will ask a disability certificate, etc. And people with disability are, are often burdened by it. And as we said, the CRPD committee wants that to change. So some countries are developing one-stop shop. Um, where basically the person with disability will have the assessment, the determination, and they will be a first um, direction uh, towards services. What we see emerging more and more is a mixed approach where you will have, for instance, the disability certification, which often will lead to a disability ID card or like in Senegal, an equal opportunity card. And this, uh, once you get the status of person with disability, usually, you will access a package, a basic package of services, which can be concession, like free transportation, maybe a basic disability allowance, depending on the level of disability that have been assessed. And 
with this disability card, you might also be able to use it for broader eligibility determination, which will not request you to do another disability assessment, but will consider your disability card or, or whatever equal opportunity card as a proof that you have actually officially recognized as a person with disabilities. So um, very quickly, this disability card, and we could have a, a webinar just on this, um, there have been some questions whether the, the card is a, a tool to access support or is a, a stigmatizing instrument. And in our conversation with organization of persons with disabilities, there, there has been this sense that, yes, it's important. In countries where it exists, people see it as a passport to get support, and it's important for them. The name of it sometimes is seen as an impediment, sometimes it's, it's not a problem. But for instance, in Senegal, Organization of Persons with Disabilities says, we don't want a disability card, we want an equal opportunity card, because we get the card because we have the right to get support for equal opportunity. And this contributes to reframing the way social protection is fought for and communicated for persons with disabilities. What is important behind uh, all this is the fact that when you collect information in disability assessment, very often they are used just to say yes and no to the status or yes and no to uh, eligibility to some uh, benefits. Most importantly, this information should be gathered in national uh, disability registry that could also support local and national uh, policy planning expansion of services. We are always saying, oh, there is a dearth of data on disability. We do not know the needs of persons with disabilities. If, as a government, you are spending money on, dis on making disability assessment, which is collecting more information than you will ever have in a specific survey, make the most of it. M value for money of disability assessment means building an information system that will analyze this data, of course, anonymize those data, to, uh, to do the most in terms of policy planning. But it can be also a great way to have um, case management. And you can connect national disability registry with single registry, uh, with, of course, taking care of privacy issues, and to really help integration of persons with disabilities within the broader social protection system. So, very quickly, what is assessed? And this is probably one of the biggest challenges we have today. Um, we know that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability insists on the fact that disability is an interaction between persons with long-term impairment, among others, and barriers in the environment that may restrict their participation. So when you do a disability assessment, you want to have this picture. You want to understand the situation of the person. But when you do disability determination, which is when you decide if the person is officially a person with disability or not, you might not take into consideration all those information. Why? For instance, the environment changes. Today I am in a village with my family. Maybe tomorrow I will be alone in a big city. Today my wife or my husband is providing me support. Tomorrow there may be a divorce and I will lose all this support. And so it's really important to, to have this distinction. I assess the situation of persons with disabilities and I will use that for disability determination, policy planning and case management. Official disability determination should be based on elements that do not change too much over a, a short or a midterm, because otherwise people would have to reassess constantly. So what is the question to which the disability assessment should answer? What is the person able to do with or without assistance? What is the person not able to do? What are the support needs of the person? What are the barriers faced by the person? What would it take for the person to function equally or to participate equally? All of it. Ideally, the disability assessment would be as comprehensive as possible to provide information, as I mentioned, not only for disability determination, but also for case management. Um, the challenge is that often, <laughs> When you do comprehensive, you do complicated. And if you do complicated, it's hard to implement. And if it's hard to implement, it means it will not be implemented all over the country and many people will lose out. So there is a need to, to think comprehensiveness and balancing with, with simplicity. From a social point, 
protection point of view, there are issues also, like government want to have evidence of long-term impairment. They want to associate that for, for different reasons. They want to have an idea of the barrier that may restrict participation, the support requirement and the support needs of the person. Um, and as I said, but all those information do not have always to be uh, included in disability determination while they are included in disability uh, assessment. So assessment that are done today, it's still often the impairment approach where we will have a medical certificate looking only at the impairment of the person. But more and more, we have the functional approach, which is basically assessing the functional limitation in basic activities. And there is this approach that you may have heard of, which is, for instance, described shortly in the source book of the World Bank, the disability approach, which would be this very comprehensive approach on the outcome of the interaction between people and their environment. And as I mentioned, this is really something you want to assess. The problem is, what will you use for disability determination? And our sense, and it's still something at work, we, we need to have a broader conversation with the CRPD committee, and the country example will give you also a sense of this. We would advise to, to make a broad and comprehensive assessment, but basing determination on functional and support needs, rather than the overall outcome, which include very, a lot of variable, which can lead to a lot of discretion and complexity. So one of the key questions for countries is medical assessment. And what we know is that it's required in many countries. And in low and middle income countries, the medical assessment is actually a barrier to access support because the, the health system is not that developed, because there is not enough trained people to do the assessment. So some countries are starting to do, for instance, mobile assessment camp. They will have uh, different medic doctors going in some camps in the rural areas, etc. But they do that once every some years. <laughs> and this is not a solution. Um, it seems to be preferred because it's objective, um, it's a tool against fraud, and actually it's not. There is discretion in, disability, in medical assessment, and it's not a, 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 a tool that is so effective against corruption or, or fraud. And uh, what we saw also is that it's an opportunity cost for the healthcare system. Doctors are very overloaded and they do not give the time required for the, for the assessment. So some countries have decided, like Fiji, Vietnam, uh, Nepal, not to make the medical assessment the first requirement. It's actually used more as a verification in case social worker or community worker are not in position to do uh, the medical assessment. And we will see that, for instance, with, with Fiji. So we have a, a, a proposal for a multi-step approach where in the social protection system, you can identify households that are likely to have persons with disability. And if so, uh, they can be persons with disability can, can be referred to a simple functional assessment, support need assessment that would be carried out by non-medical staff in the uh, local uh, level. And people can access directly also. If um, the, the, the assessment is positive, then people will get the disability status and they may receive also at that time a basic eligibility package. If the, the community worker or the local worker is not in position to do the assessment for different reasons, there could be a confirmation or a verification assessment, which might be uh, more extensive. The important thing is that if this happens, the system should support and cover the cost of this confirmation or verification assessment. It's the system we need the proof, not the person with disabilities. And this is extremely important. If we want the disability assessment to be a tool for inclusion, not a tool of ex exclusion, it should be free of charge and easily accessible for everybody. So that's extremely important to, to think of that. And then you can have, of course, uh, for instance, uh, you will need an appeal mechanism. And if you need specific assessment, for instance, for assistive device or support services, you might have additional assessment that would be there for those specific services that may be granted to people, as well also with uh, an appeal mechanism. 
And what's important is this information should feed into single registry and disability registry with, of course, uh, a privacy uh, concern taken into consideration. We won't talk about the tools much, but there are many out there. What's important is no tool off the shelf is effective. You will need to make an adaptation of the tool. So to conclude, basically, learn from others and build your own. And the first question you should ask yourself is, what are the main challenge of the current system? What is the service infrastructure and the human resource we have to ensure that we will be able to do it at everywhere in the country and it will be available and accessible for everybody? What are the mechanisms we could put in place to ensure quality control and fraud prevention? Once you have answered those questions, ask yourself, what is the tool that we need? What kind of tool that we need that will be uh, usable by the people at the local level? And very often it's the opposite. We start thinking about the tool and then we wonder how we will train the people to, to use the tool. And it's not working so well. It's extremely important to develop instruments that are actually based on the capacity you have at the local level so that the disability assessment is as close as possible and as accessible as possible for a person with disabilities. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the further presentation. Felicity. Felicity, we are not hearing you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Alex. Um, we have a couple of questions about using the Washington group questions. Um, Shajat has asked a couple of questions about using these questions in the context of um, Bangladesh um, in um, some of the camps there. Um, I was wondering if um, you might be able to help shut up with um, the um, the question around using your customary language. Do you have difficulty communicating, for example, understanding or being understood? Um, there's been a lot of problems with using that question in on the community as there are a lot of illiterate um, people. I was wondering if there was um, a tool that you could recommend to back up the Washington Group questions to um, assist with that kind of assessment. Um, and um, I was wondering, Shajat, and you can um, reply on the Q&A whether um, you have um, received some, some good training on how to use the questions from, um, from your organisation. So over to you, Alex, if you have any suggestions yeah. on some other tools that could be used. And thank you very much. I, I told I think the, the, that's exactly what, what we were talking about. So there are issues of translation. We know it with the, the Washington group questions, and it requires a lot of work uh, to, to, to get exactly the meaning of the questions and, and make sure that people really understand what it means requires some work. And, and this has been, it has been an issue in, in few countries. We, we know that. But this is what we meant with regards to disability assessment. Um, you, it's hard to rely just on six questions or 10 questions if you want to really assess the situation of a person or overall functional limitation and support requirement. So I, what I would advise is trying to see um, using other tools like you would have uh, the ICF checklist, you have the WUDAS, but you have also many countries that have developed tailor-made uh, disability assessment tool where you can borrow a few questions related to communication which would be more about asking uh, how people can perform certain tasks. Um, are you able to communicate with people in a room that is very noisy or et cetera, et cetera, that are very concrete examples that people will, be, will easily be able to answer. But even those questions need to be very contextualized because people don't interact in the same way everywhere. So this is why we, we insist to say, you need to, you need to tailor. It's taking things off the shelf. And we know that the Washington group question have been used and increasingly used in this context. We just want to warn. They are a tool, they are a blunt instrument for surveys and census. And they can help 
if you need something quick because you you expand you you can use them you will still need to refine but please don't make the assumption that job is done okay? because it's not it's it's important to to make this investment and as i said tailoring to the context as as much as we can um, but if you want, you can connect with us. We can connect you also with, with people like Daniel Mont or others that are really experts on this and that could help you. Thank you, Alex, that's great. Um, Umid has also asked if um, it would be possible to present the list of the tools once again. Um, we will be putting those up on the webinar with the presentation um, over the next couple of days. So you will be able to see the list of tools there. And um, once you have had a look at them, if you do have any questions about them or want some more information, you can get in touch with myself or some of the panelists to ask further questions about that, but we will put them up on um, the website over the coming days. I think we've got another question coming in here. Okay, I think we might move on to Josh now. Um, Josh, are you ready to present on your um, Fiji case study? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Great. Over to you. Thank you. Um, Blavanaka, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the designing of the access, uh, assessing disability to access uh, Fiji disability allowance scheme. Uh, could we please cut to the next slide? Um, the shift from the original family assistance scheme into the current schemes provided a better suit for, for purpose. Upon evaluation of the three existing schemes prior to the establishment of the disability allowance scheme, uh, gaps, was, gaps was identified in relation to persons with disabilities specifically. Uh, during this period, the ministry identified the organization for persons with disability would be best fitted to advise government on a scheme for their members or for a financial scheme that is a targeted at persons with disabilities. Um, the, the, these consultation uh, on the engagement with the organization for persons with disabilities, context of disability, extra cost, and the interaction including gaps within other existing schemes relevant to persons with disability uh, started becoming more and more visible. Uh, the consultations um, uh, also uh, contributed to the opening of the other schemes, making sure that it's compatible uh, to disability and to persons with disability. Uh, the disability allowance scheme uh, is not means tested uh, currently and it's uh, compatible uh, with a work a poverty benefit scheme, but the individual, an individual currently cannot qualify for two separate schemes. Meaning is that if a person uh, who lives alone and has a disability and um, is um, uh, also below the poverty line, cannot qualify for both. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the engagement highlighted the benefits of engaging and providing space uh, for persons with disability and for their uh, organizations on issues related to them because it is a, it is a government priority. It is uh, it's a government responsibility for all its citizens. But then working in collaboration with uh, persons with disabilities themselves and their organizations um, saw that uh, you know, government actually started to see that they, this is a better approach and that we can get it right. Uh, the activity from draft to implementation was in collaboration uh, with the organizations. Uh, during the first year alone, during the pilot phase, there was a total of six modifications to the process where persons with disabilities themselves and their representative organizations were part of the draft, the trial, implement back again to draft. Sometimes we went to trial back to draft even before you know moving forward. So eventually, once everything then got uh, prepared, you know, once everybody was then comfortable, and this you know uh, took um, you know over a year in terms of trial and trying to perfect it. Next slide, please. Um, the the opportunity to to partner, you know, enable a platform for the 
uh, organized persons with disabilities uh, providers uh, to existing systems uh, and structures uh, you know, that are not opposed to another. I think uh, as Alex said earlier presented is that it was adapting you know, what was uh, currently in existence. For most persons that enter government systems, uh, the expectation is that you need to already know what you, uh, needs to be done. Uh, it's, it wasn't initially very consultative at that. Uh, you know, uh, things have actually developed and changed is because the tools that they were using also, realizing that uh, organizing persons with disabilities also had their own tools in terms of how they assess, uh, you know, to look at uh, what, was the, what was available. The method of the, the testing, the verification was something that uh, kept coming into question in terms of how do we verify. Uh, when uh, when individuals need further, there was a, there's a uh, slight also a trade off in this area. By the time we know we start looking at uh, is the tools working? Um, you know, when time we look at okay, how, uh, is persons with disability can they come to this environment? Do we need to go out uh, into their home uh, for site visits? So this is where you know looking at okay, what different types of tools is available? How do we do it? How do we modify it? Um, the challenges, uh, you know, one time we're looking at uh, addressing the, the programs one time we're uh, doing the pilot phase, most of the uh, challenges that was faced was um, to try and actually, God, the one thing you have to understand about Fiji, you're talking about over 300 islands uh, in Fiji. And then for main centers, uh, most of the services available on mainland. But this is something that government was determined together with a push from the disability sector is to ensure that if it's a national disability allowance, how can every citizen in this country then be supported? So looking at, okay, what resources are currently available? How can and what type of add-ons is needed to ensure that this is then provided? Um, the DPOs then provided support when and where needed. This also built the capacity of the uh, organization for persons with disability because government when and where needed also provided budgetary uh, support uh, for them. Next slide, please. Uh, the assessment and eligibility determination process. Um, the eligibility of individuals uh, post assessment is ranked according to individuals functionality and support needs. So uh, from the zero to 63 um, is that uh, look at those of with severe disability. So look, okay, how much functions do you have, a limitation? So they measure the limitations of the person compared to everybody else. Anything that is from zero to 63, approval is effective and the person then is awarded and supported accordingly. Anybody that is above that, um, often the, there is process in terms of if they do not qualify, then they have to be supported into other programs. If there's opportunities into other programs. Um, so the welfare officer who's actually on the ground actually is the person that is there to see uh, and to identify if the individual actually qualifies the criteria. If they do not agree with the assessment that's been carried out, they also have the opportunity to appeal through existing uh, uh, platforms within the program itself. Um, they, uh, when time also during assessments is that looking at ensuring that the individual, if the welfare officer is not comfortable, for example, for those that uh, have hearing impairment but not completely deaf, for those that are visually impaired but not completely blind, um, the process in terms of uh, the support, uh, the authentication of the person, do they qualify, yes or no? Um, this is where often it becomes um, um, the context of support by organizing persons with disability can also become a verification point. Also, the extended members of the community, they actually act on what they thought. So there's, there's a trade-off in terms of privacy of information of the individual against the assessment that's being carried out. The next slide, please. Uh, what, is, what is important to note is that for, for the whole process, uh, the trade-off that has been done, as I, as I mentioned, as far as for those with out of hearing or not completely blind, this is uh, one of the um, uh, why, why this is put also in place is that 
medical assessments uh, in Fiji can become quite costly. Not only the actual assessment itself, but getting from the environment where they live to actually access where the medical services are available in order to provide uh, that support system or to provide that verification can be an expensive exercise. If that is the case, uh, what with the DPOs, then uh, on during the consultation, uh, you know, inform the government, uh, it is you who want us to actually prove our disability. It is you that want us to prove that we need support system, support service, and the level of it in order to qualify for the scheme. So it is only fair that you, through the support of the DPOs, whom is as also supported by government financially, to provide that uh, pathway uh, from ensuring that the person then gets the medical certification uh, in, um, to, uh, then uh, to, as part of the verification of assessment. So with the, uh, to enable cost effectiveness, government has now uh, looked at and um, also taken on board as far as verification from the village headman, uh, from other members of the community, uh, from their representative organizations, uh, instead of uh, looking at the medical um, assessment. But the medical assessment is still there and when and where needed and when we're applicable, the person is assessed or supported to get medical certification. The next slide, please. Uh, the successful rollout of the, the program uh, to date, um, as mentioned uh, on the first year, uh, it was, there was a lot of trial and error, trial and error. Um, government did not give up on um, the consultations with the organizations for persons with disability. Um, what resulted from it uh, was actually um, something that we can uh, also build on. And now government uh, initially as the consultation out of the programs for deaths and these consultations that, that happened over that 12 months period and also continuous over the last two years and improving, um, it is now mandatory for all government funded programs to disability to be consultative. And as you can see, as far as the, 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 the change, uh, especially in the, the current financial year and the jump is because one, um, the government systems has become more confident in what we do and what we're about. And also the organizations for persons with disability have become are confident in a program that they know is about them. And they know that uh, even for those that are working, do qualify, know that it is related to their disability or their, their impairment cost, the, the disability cost, um, as a barrier in order to ensure equality. Next slide, please. Thank you. As you can see, uh, there is a map of Fiji there. Um, you know, hoping that you can visit us when you can. Uh, and the partners from Fiji. Uh, wish you well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Josh. It was great to hear about um, the Fiji example. It sounds like you have a very comprehensive community-based assessment um, program happening in Fiji. Um, I was wondering, though, what kind of um, grievance um, redress mechanisms you have in place with the, um, with the assessment system. Um, it'd be great if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Felicity. The current system is that uh, because the welfare officer um, you know, goes out for the first time if they do go out and if they make the assessment and the person don't qualify, uh, the individual through their uh, representative organization can lodge uh, to the disability unit, uh, a unit that is embedded, uh, who actually leads or heads for government, the, dis the uh, disability allowance, either the rollout, the payout. Um, then we then call the, uh, the organization, the representative organization, then consults on their behalf to the unit. Then together, they then support the person as far as the full authentication or verification of the person's need, right up to if there needs to be a medical certification. So the person can ask, but even after the person then goes through that, and the person still does not meet the criteria, 
then special consideration is given, for example, um, if the family is already living under poverty uh, and receiving the poverty uh, allowance, uh, a poverty benefit scheme, the special consideration are then given again to the individual. If it is a child, it's under the care and protection scheme. So there's, uh, there's a grievance process in place that to try and change the, uh, the decision or to turn the decision uh, to, uh, uh, for uh, the person who's applying. But even beyond that also, there's also other support systems within the other protection schemes. But one thing that needs to be, um, one thing I'd like to also indicate in this juncture is that even for a person who don't qualify uh, for the disability allowance scheme, is still entitled to the other social protection schemes such as bus fare concession, such as economic empowerment program. The ineligibility for the desk does not, it does not impact their qualification uh, to the other support systems that are available. We don't have a either or system. You don't have, it's not about choosing you have this one or that one. You, you can have multiple support systems. That's great. Thanks, Josh. Um, I have a couple of questions um, going back to Alex's um, presentation. Um, we, we've got a um, question here about um, sort of long term illnesses and um, the costs of treatment. Um, are there any tools that you could recommend, Alex, that um, would help to um, provide an assessment of that um, situation? This is, uh, I think, uh, I, I thank Lee for this question. This is indeed one of the tricky, tricky points. Uh, people with chronic, chronic illnesses, but also people who have um, illnesses that can be seriously incapacitating, but may not be constant. How, how do you make the assessment of that? So um, I think that uh, for people who have um, very strong impacting uh, chronic illnesses, Functional assessment will, det will detect a lot. Um, but I, I, I think medical assessment can be used. A medical certificate for that can be used. I, I just answered one of the, the questions before. We are not saying that the medical assessment should never be used. That's not, that, that's not at all the, the point of our, uh, our argument. What we are saying is that it should not be the first prerequisite because then it becomes a barrier. That's, that's the, the important thing. Um, there, I think, again, it's not so much the disability assessment, I think, than the disability determination. In many countries, people with chronic illnesses that do not have um, severe functional limitation will not be considered a person with disabilities. Think of people with HIV AIDS. In some countries, they are considered uh, possibly person with disabilities. In some countries, they are not. Cancer survivors, uh, people with uh, hemophilia, et cetera, et cetera. So I think here the issue is much more about um, should that be covered under the universal health coverage or is it really a disability issue? What, what is it? And I, I think that many issues that are under the, 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 the access to medication, um, it's in a gray zone. And it's really depending on the, if you ask me, I think it's a UHC issue, definitely. It should be covered under the universal health coverage. But there are other issues, as you mentioned, the side effect, the functional limitation related to it that may qualify people for, uh, for disability support. I don't think it's mostly a disability assessment issue. I think it's much more a disability determination issue, which is would the country officially consider that people who have mild or uh, episodic functional difficulties due to the, the chronic illness and medication side effects would be considered person with disabilities. This is why I really insisted at the beginning on this difference between disability assessment, which is the question you ask and the information you collect, and disability determination, which is the official decision you take based on a legal, legally binded set of criteria, or at least programmatically binded set of criteria. So I think it's, it's an important issue. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. 
Um, just one more question um, that has come through, and I'll probably throw this one over to Alex, but please step in any of the other guest speakers if um, you'd like to contribute. But um, there was a question about um, with the medical community and doctors losing control of the assessment process. Um, have you had any experience with dealing with this situation and how have you managed it? So uh, I think actually I would I would rather go to Josh or, or Donna or, or um, Ket, Ketevan because I think they have been in the middle of it. Um, how do you deal with, uh, with with the healthcare professional? What I can say is indeed it's an issue in many countries where the the, the medical um, there is this uh, sense that doctors know better and. The, that's what they used to do. And the idea that a social worker could do a functional assessment is really bizarre. And I think there is a, there is a lot of work to be done. And there are, are truth to be said, is that medical assessment do not prevent fraud. Actually, corruption in healthcare is fairly widespread. Let's be honest about that in many countries. So the issue of saying, oh yeah, medical doctor assessment is uh, 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 a mechanism against fraud doesn't really doesn't really work but this it's when you go deeper this issue of what is disability what do we understand of disability what's the medical aspect of of the impairment aspect in disability what is its weight in the decision etc those are deep conversation that needs to happen they are not easy conversation indeed but I'm sure that Josh, uh, Donna, and, and Ketevan can provide more insight into that. I think Felicity uh, from my end is that there have also been times where the medical certificates, because here, as I said, the medical certificate is paid. So sometimes the family or the individual, uh, you know, would come up with the funds to pay for a medical report. Uh, so that they want in the, the doctor to state that this person has a disability. But that does not also mean that they automatically qualify. The verification has to be one because the government has also questioned uh, you know, the, how, they, how they got the verification. Because for most cases, when a patient goes to the doctor for medical report, and if it's paid for especially with private doctors, you tell them what you're after and what you need. So it's like going to the doctor and telling the doctor, would you please give me a sick sheet? I don't want to go to work tomorrow. And then uh, stating, okay, this A, B, C, D. So for those that do not qualify according to the functionality up to 64%, there have been cases that have been um, reviewed even after a medical certificate to really authenticate to see. And that's, um, that's why uh, we've also felt initially and why we found a government took in easily the context of let's leave that for the last. And once we need to get there, Let's get to those that have been approved to do the assessments. So uh, only now is looking at, okay, those doctors that give, give a true assessment will then be endorsed and accepted, and not just from any doctor. And those doctors are also now, hopefully is that what we're now working towards that they waive the, the medical fees. It is about ensuring that they are available uh, in different divisions so that there's cost effectiveness is because one, we're not expecting the um, client to afford the bill, but yet the state. So having them in the different divisions and then getting them to waive the cost is the way forward. We've actually started that now with our psychiatric hospital. So within the psychiatric hospital, one of the assessments for somebody with psychosocial disability, the psychiatric doctors already are now engaged and working closely with a disability unit, informing them and saying, oh, this case has been brought to attention. This person will need the support systems. Um, it's because the, the individual uh, has been identified with this form of psychosocial. I think from the Laos perspective, I can definitely say we've experienced this issue uh, with the Ministry of Health being quite reluctant and sometimes resistant to our community workers completing a needs assessment, especially when it comes to questions around health, function, assistive products and mental health. And I think 
from my perspective, because we've developed a new tool, we've been very lucky that we've brought all our partners together right from the beginning to design it and to train the community workers to use it. Um, it hasn't countered all that resistance from the Ministry of Health that we've had, and also from other ministries like Labour Social Welfare, because they, they do feel that community workers are often unqualified and shouldn't be asking such questions like that. But I think getting them involved from the beginning, that they're, they're, they're there when we train community workers, They've been involved in choosing the questions and they come with us to the communities when we ask these questions. Um, it's not a completely smooth process, but we found, we found that's the best way to go forward. Thanks, Josh and Donna. We'll move on to our next speaker now. So um, we've got Ketavan from Georgia, who works for UNICEF. Um, take it away, Kitwa. Ketevan, you're muted. I'm sorry, I have been talking a lot. Uh, so, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. My name is Katie Melikadze. I work for UNICEF country office in Georgia. And my presentation is about uh, reforming the disability assessment and status determination system in my country, which is an ongoing process and which followed the ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Um, I'm trying to move slides. Uh, okay, so just to let you know that um, we are still in the pilot process and uh, the current system is still very much based on and centered on medical diagnosis. Uh, its effect on the person functioning or their everyday living or activities is not taken into consideration. Just to let you know also that there is a legislative act which lists all the types of the medical diagnosis which makes a person eligible to get a disability status. So after medical examination, only those person gets the status whose diagnosis matches the one that is on this normative list. So given this existing rigid system, we have many people with the uh, severe impairments or functional limitations who are excluded from the current system. So let's say the children with uh, some developmental delays or adults who have multiple health conditions, none of which um, are being on this list. Those are the persons who are excluding and cannot benefit from the support system that uh, the country can offer persons to dis with disabilities. Uh, on the top of that, uh, we have a registry, centralized registry of person with disability, which really has a very limited information. It provides information on the number of people who are, have official status of disability, disaggregated by age, gender, geographical location, maybe levels of disability. However, its information is very limited in order to help government to make a proper planning policies and intervention for inclusive uh, support to persons with disability. So just to give you some uh, idea how it works on the ground, uh, there are medical facilities all over the Georgia licensed to provide the medical examination and uh, determine the status of disability. Uh, the status seeker is self-referred or referred by different uh, institutions like health, uh, health institutions. Uh, the person is greeted by the medical professional, the so-called expert, who takes a person through the system, gets through the medical um, examination, uh, medical consultations, and uh, sets the diagnosis. And again, if diagnosis matches with the list, then they get the status. So for adults, status would be uh, different based on severity of disability. And there's three levels, profound, severe, and moderate. But for children, there is one single status of a child with disability. 
You can see the numbers and percentages and uh, really see how much we undercount persons with disability. For entire population of persons with disability, we only see 3%, but for children, it's even less, 1.3%, which is very low and which means that we uh, do not see and do not support many people who are in need of support and inclusion. Uh, again, to give you a bit more flavor of the types of support uh, people with disability are getting, uh, uh, persons with disability are getting in Georgia, I will not get into details of the chart, just to let you know that likewise, my colleague was talking about the Fiji. In Georgia as well, all, almost all support are complementary. So for example, a child with disability can get support from the central government as well from the local municipalities. The support might include uh, disability cash benefits. If a child is from the poor household, her share of um, uh, targeted social assistance support, being a child, she is entitled to the child grant. Uh, all different types of support, including for example, financial vouchers to access specialized services, being it early intervention, daycare, home care, or rehabilitation services. So all this tops up. And uh, in many cases, when the services, especially when the services are accessible, uh, available, provide the comprehensive, more or less comprehensive support to child with disability. We can see similar trend for the adults. And again, I will not get into details, just to mention that unlike different countries, um, employment of person with disability uh, doesn't conflict with getting the cash, um, disability cash benefit. So everything else is added up and person is getting more or less decent support. Uh, but in order to uh, comply with the requirements of uh, CRPD and their spirit and the principles, and also to ensure more inclusion coverage and inclusion of persons with disability, uh, the government embarked on a, a reformation of the system and approached UNICEF to provide um, some type of technical support and expertise in this process. So we started with the pilot in one region and here we are just completing the pilot, uh, which worked at a different level. We wanted to see, first of all, how the process is ongoing in the same level of medical clinics, but unlike having only medical examination, a person is undergoing three tier examination, medical, functional and examination of their social needs and barriers. Uh, the, uh, the approach is uh, very much multi-sectoral, um, multi-dimensional, which gives opportunity to really see what are the person's needs and individual characteristics. Uh, what was very important for us that we developed country-based uh, assessment, functional assessment instrument for a child, which is based on uh, international classification of functioning. But for adults, we use WHO's instrument, who does too. And these uh, two instruments look a bit uh, alike. Uh, and after completion of the pilot, we uh, went through the analysis and it was very much requested by the government to see what are the potentially the groups that might be excluded from the new systems or who are those who will be included and what are approximate cost or cost categories that we impose to the government running in the new system. So again, uh, here you see the, how the scheme will work in the new system, uh, which again is at the level of the pilot here. The person is greeted not by one, but by three professionals. They're doing their um, assessment uh, separately, medical, functional, and social needs assessment. And then all three persons go together, come together at the case discussion. And the idea, which is, has not been verified yet, but the idea is that the score of the functional assessment will uh, define the level of disability and the status. However, medical diagnosis will be used to verify that the functional profile that was defined by the assessment is indeed is possible based on the impairment and medical diagnosis that the person has. 
but the social needs assessment and assessment of barriers will be used by the case manager to link this particular person with um, uh, social protection measures and other support system, which is available in immediate community or countrywide. So um, I will not again go to very detailed uh, um, explanation of the novelties that was bring by this uh, new system. However, um, one thing that I haven't mentioned was development of the very comprehensive electronic data management application. For now, it's a standalone application, but hopefully it will be taken over by the government, which gets uh, together, puts together all type of assessment of a person and provides summary paper per person, which helps to plan his or her support system, as well as uh, summary paper for summary page for um, based on different types of indicators, which will help governments for planning the programs, policies and different types of interventions. And from this um, stage, uh, the government is thinking about rolling out uh, the system at the national level. And here we have different challenges to under uh, to overcome. And specifically, we are looking at the measures that ensure quality of the new functioning system and its sustainability. For example, how to ensure that every person with disability who wants to be assessed or needs to be assessed, wherever he is, or whatever type of disability he or she has, have access to the assessment centers. Uh, what is the system or how to create a system which creates and recreates a cadre of professionals, assessment professionals, and how to ensure their professional supervision? Uh, what system would be monitoring the new system and how to do it in order to ensure at least minimal acceptable quality and also prevent or mitigate risks of the fraud? Uh, again, the issue of electronic data management system, which will be a strong tool in hands of the governments to plan for future support. Uh, all this will need legislative changes, which has to be uh, to take place. And final, but not least, and I haven't mentioned it before, is the shift of public perception and negative social norms and stigma, which is associated with disability explaining people and putting them into a new concept of disability that was defined by the CRPD to create more enabling environment for the inclusion. And the next step to come is linking this disability assessment and status determination process with the social entitlement being at the central or local level, being it cash or services. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Felicity. Great. Thanks, Ketvan. It was great to hear about um, the work you've been doing in Georgia. I just had one question about, um, I noticed, um, and you mentioned that um, the, the rates of the disability allowance were pretty low, that about 3% of the population were eligible for the support. Um, has the, the government been um, triangulating the data with um, the sort of surveys, like the high surveys that um, are capturing the um, prevalence data on um, disability. Um, is that kind of work happening in the background too? Uh, yes, actually there are many surveys that uh, from which you can get uh, information about the prevalence. For example, the latest census 2014 had inserted the question, Washington group questions, which gave us an understanding about the prevalence. And uh, in 2018, uh, UNICEF supported the government to undertake the uh, UNICEF's largest survey mix, multiple indicator cluster survey, which has also uh, the modules on functionality of adults and children. So with this more comprehensive questionnaire, we now have a real understanding on the prevalence as well as types of functional limitations that our citizens have. Great, thanks, um, Kedavan. Ludovicio Carraro has um, put a question to you, and he would like to know how many more people have been identified as needing support in the pilot system? 
So the pilot uh, was done for um, more than, uh, was going on almost one year in one region of Georgia, and it covered uh, the persons, around 700 persons. And uh, um, it will be difficult to give, to give exact number of the segregation of the needs, but uh, how the system functions currently and how pilot was organized, we were trying to actively outreach to um, encourage people to get to the disability assessment system. But actually, in most cases, we're using the existing inflow. And uh, um, almost all that were coming have experienced certain type of uh, um, problems and issues that were leading to disabilities. And the case managers that we embedded in the health clinics were helping them to link, already link them with all existing health services. So with a very strong confidence, I can say that almost all people get additional support or reference to different types of support services through the system. Great, thank, thank you. you. That's fun for um, that um, answer. And um, let's move on now to our last speaker, Donna, who is going to present um, a case study from Laos. Over to you, Donna. Thank you. Thanks, Felicity. Hello to all the participants today. Uh, my name is Donna. I'm uh, a senior technical advisor at World Education. Um, I'm just waiting for my slides. Thank you. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. So today I'm going to present you uh, an example of developing a needs assessment, uh, not for disability assessment, but for case management in, in Laos. Um, just to give you a little bit of context of, of Laos, if, um, is that uh, Laos, a uh, landlocked country in Southeast Asia, population of approximately 7 million people, predominantly rural, um, limited health systems and social protection systems. And significantly, the country remains contaminated with unexploded ordnance from the legacy of the Indochina War. And this has really hindered the development of the country. Um, USAID OGARD is a five year project. OGARD means opportunity. Um, and we work with seven partners, um, including ministry and MPAs to support people with disabilities directly and also to strengthen systems within the government. And this focuses on health, economic empowerment, CBID and stakeholder engagement. Next slide, please. Thanks. So we have subgranted two local organizations to implement CBID activities. They lead those activities in our target communities whilst working very collaboratively with our government partners, especially the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare. And they're responsible for two main activities. They're involved in community engagement and mobilization, and they also provide case management. And I think when we started this activity, we recognized there was a real lack of data in Laos about the situation of persons with disabilities in our target villages and we needed a comprehensive needs assessment to really understand the situation. And this was our starting point in designing the tool. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, to get straight to it, we've designed a tool which is called, we've called the CBID modular tool. It's a needs assessment which is digitized. Our CBID facilitators, community workers, go to the villages with a tablet to collect data. And based on our demographics, we have created question sets for three different age groups, two to four, five to 17, and 18 years and over. And there's seven modules where we collect data so we can under, fully understand the situation of a person with disability and their family. We collect information related to education, economic participation, function assisted products, um, health conditions, mental health, caregiver needs, access and utilization of health services to identify barriers and their overall well-being. And the tool is uh, hosted on Kobo Toolbox and we've created a customized database that, where we can um, import that data to. Next slide, please. So, um, 
with our target villages, we do a, a, a basic screening initially to identify potential households where we think there's a person with disability. And once we have that list from each village, uh, the community worker arranges to go and meet the family, um, usually at their home or in a convenient location in the village. It may well be in the rice paddy field while they're working, um, wherever is accessible for them. And as you saw from the list of, of topics that we cover in the previous slide, it's, it's a lot of information we're collecting. So the tool can take one to two hours to complete, and we'll do that with breaks, but it really does depend on the complexity of the situation of, of the person. Modules can be done separately in shorter sessions, and we factored that in when we planned our activities, but what we've actually found is that most families prefer to sit and go through the whole assessment in one go because they just really value the fact that someone is there on that day asking these questions to them that maybe no one's ever asked them before. The tool can be used online and offline and um, once it's completed, it can be saved module by module and it's uploaded, uploaded to a customized database that we've created where it is validated by our MEL team um, and is there to start an analysis um, to determine what interventions the person might be eligible for, uh, for case management. This is the initial interview, um, but as interventions are completed um, and we're coming to the, towards the end of case management, um, the assessment will be repeated because we really want to measure the changes. We want to see if needs have changed, if they've been met or are still unmet and to plan a discharge for that person if they are gonna, if they're gonna end uh, case management. And next slide, thank you. So to give you a sense of what it really looks like, um, this is a few snapshots from our CBID database, um, which we've had a, a, a support from an IT specialist to develop this for us. Um, in the top left, you can see basically a CBID facilitator, a community worker can log into the tablet and they'll see a list of cases. And they'll have two boxes next to that case ID number. There's a green box, which says the modular tool and there's a blue box for action plan. If they click on that box for modular tool, it will reveal the screen that you can see directly underneath that. It's a series of boxes for the initial interview results. And the boxes come in different colors with the name of the area. So if a box is white, it means the data has not been uploaded yet. If it's green, which there isn't any in this shot here, it means there's no needs um, identified. And if the box is red, that's where we have identified an unmet need where we think where you can support the family. And if the CBID facilitator clicks on that box, um, what is revealed is the snapshot on the right is a list of questions, um, which we call trigger questions that have raised a red flag for us. So it will list out the question and what that answer was. And the CBID facilitator can use that to start to develop an action plan with the family. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So designing the tool, um, as Alex said earlier, we, we knew of many international tools developed already, but we just didn't feel they fitted what we wanted and the context of Lao. Uh, we wanted a holistic person-centered um, needs assessment. Uh, we wanted to understand needs, unmet needs. We wanted to understand level of participation. We wanted to know what barriers existed in the community. So we could then look at coming up with a, a, a case management, uh, sorry, a, an action plan that would really meet the needs of the family and the person with disability. So the second criteria that was very important for us is easy to use by the teams, easy to collect data, easy to analyze, develop the action plan. We needed to supervise them technically remotely. And for our donor, we also needed to have some measurement of MEL parameters for our results framework. So we thought this was quite a complex task and we had many different ideas within our team. So we decided we needed help. So we partnered with the Nozzle Institute of Global Health at the University of Melbourne to help us out to develop the tool. Next slide, thank you. So 
Oh, it's been it's been a long process, and I I can't deny that it's not a complex one, uh, but it has been an enjoyable one where I think the whole of our team have learned many things in this process. We started off by having the university help us identify what were the source tools that could give us the questions that we wanted to ask to understand the situation of, of people in the communities we worked in. And then we went through a process of starting to develop the tool initially in English, then translating it into Lao, um, testing it and uh, digitizing it, uh, training our team to use it, re refining it and refining it many, many, many times. And this has involved people with disabilities who work within our teams and also DPOs and our government partners as well. And the tool was tested with a sample of people from our communities to really figure out was it working well. Um, so it's been very well validated with the supervision of the university to help us. Next slide. So this is what the overall structure looks like to give you a sense of uh, uh, what, what, what it contains. On the left side, you'll see the list of the modules that I talked about before. And on the right side, you see the different boxes which reference all the different question sets um, by age or by um, who is gonna answer the question. It will most likely always be the person with disability, but it also may be the head of the household. It also might be a caregiver. It also might be a proxy if that's, that's required. Um, Next slide. At one point, we wondered whether we were setting the bar too high. Uh, we got a little bit nervous because we recognized that community workers were using this tool, but how would they make sense of it after they answer, got all that information from families? Um, and we decided the best way to do this was to create decision trees. Um, so. We carefully analyzed all our questions to look at which questions should trigger a red flag for us that there's an unmet need. And you'll see this example here. This is for the caregiver module. We have four questions, which for us are a trigger that that caregiver needs support. And then underneath those, in those questions, you've got the response, which again triggers the red flag. Uh, because with the multiple responses for each question, not all of them will trigger an unmet need. So Based on this decision tree, this will cause that red box that I showed you on the database earlier to be green or red um, and give an indication to the community worker what they should do next. And for the whole of the tool, we have 28 decision trees, which vary in complexity. Next slide. So where we are now is we've done 200 needs assessments uh, so far. And um, to share some of our lessons learned from that process, I, I, could, I could talk for much longer, but I've only got a limited time. So I've picked my top five lessons learned. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, as we went through the process, we realized the tool was complex because we wanted it to be comprehensive. And we worried whether they could actually use, the team, the community workers could use it successfully. And they did. So I think this, was a real success for us, that we, we managed that they could determine needs of persons with disabilities and their families and start to design an action plan. Even though the tool has many, many questions, um, what led to that success? Well, I would say that the initial training and the ongoing supervision was essential, especially in the initial stages. And I think the fact that the tool was digitized and we created this very simple database helped us to achieve that. Um, as mentioned earlier, working with our government partners has been really crucial and especially with our health partners, they were very nervous about some of the questions that a community worker would be asking, really feeling they weren't qualified, especially around mental health, but also around function, assisted products and the health condition. And we have had instances where we have a list of health conditions where the, the community worker either observes something or the person self-reports their health condition, that these have been marked incorrectly. Um, so 
to work with our government partners and, and reduce those fears that they had that the person wasn't qualified to do it and to get their cooperation, we've really had it that our, our health partners and our labor social welfare partners go to the villages as part of the needs assessment. They are there to verify the process. If something's not clear for us, we work with the head of the village who may know the family really well and can clarify if the information is correct. And we, we've really started to use the tool um, when we do our monitoring trips in the field, we use it before we go out to visit families and we use it after in our debriefs using the database to check and verify the information. Um, I think the decision trees, um, they were difficult to make uh, in the initial and it, it was something quite new for the university to do as well. Um, but I have to say that has been crucial to being able to figure out what what are the needs of this family and how should we support them however saying that that dis, despite the comprehensive list of questions that we have sometimes real life context is missing and this is where we really emphasize you have to have a, a clear collaboration with the person and the family to verify the results are correct that it really reflects the real situation that they're living uh, in and I think lastly, the, 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 one of the other takeaways from my perspective is that needs are not static. They change over time. And the fact that we had a digitized tool and this database that, that we could use in the field made it effective for us to actually update that data. Because I mean, we, over the last period we've implemented this, we've had COVID-19, um, we've had different situations in Laos that have affected families. And we found that things have changed um, based on the needs assessment. So that's a very quick snapshot this afternoon of what we've done in Laos. Um, I think my takeaway point is, if you're thinking of developing a tailored tool for your country context is, don't be scared to do it. Um, go for it. It, is, it isn't easy, uh, but it's possible. And, and I think we're, really happy that we did this and, and hopefully we've created an innovative tool that is working well in Laos and we hope as our project moves forward our government partners at the Ministry of Labour Social Welfare who are seeing the benefits of the data not only for case management but to help them with planning um, and also with our partners at the Ministry of Health who need to expand services um, that this gives them the data that they need and we hope they'll continue to use this tool in the future with this uh, the community teams that we've developed thank you great thanks donna that was um a wonderful overview of the work you've been doing in laos and i really liked the last point that you made that um things aren't static and they do change over time and um a really important point that you made there um, I think we just have time for one question um, before we wrap up. We're going a little bit over time. So um, Donna, just one question to you. Um, so this is from Kathy, and um, she's asked, what is the long-term aim? How does this five-year funded project build into strengthening systems within Laos, working with local government, but also DPOs? How is the data being managed, protected, and what is the handover plan at the end of this project? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things why, why we chose two local MPAs to implement case management is we saw sustainability in that. Um, where CBID in the past in Laos has been done with government partners and it's been one of those situations that once the funding is gone, um, the activity disappears and doesn't happen, it fades away. So though that database um, is there for the local MPAs. We work closely with them with their MEL team so they know how to maintain that database and that will continue with them as a tool that they can use. Um, we have rules and regulations we follow from USAID so we've definitely built in uh, parameters around confidentiality and who can use the database um, so we, we protect that data. In terms of our government partners, I mean, this connects quite closely to the other work we do in our pro in USA regard that I've not talked about today. We're working with the Ministry of Health to strengthen health and rehabilitation systems, um, availability of assistive products, 
And, and one of the challenges that Laos has is underutilization of services. So by identifying people in the community, we are finding people to use services and to get them there. This feeds in data for the, to the Ministry of Health, especially to understand that those services are important to have. And based on the data that we get from that and the results that we see, we're hoping that's a driver for the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Labour Social Welfare to continue to expand services uh, for persons with disability and use that data. Um, they have two key strategies that we're supporting them to implement. It's the rehabilitation strategy and the disability law, which are very new to Laos. And so we see that this data is connected, uh, all interconnected to support us towards our overall goal of the project. I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks Donna. Um, I'd like to um, invite you all to enter the post webinar survey. Um, there should be a link in the chat function that will come up shortly. Um, make sure that you sign up to the social protection um, newsletter to keep updated about future webinars. I'm sorry that we've run out of time to answer any more questions. We do have a couple of questions that we haven't had a chance to answer tonight, but we will answer those questions and put them up with the webinar um, in um, a couple of days when we put the, um, the transcript online. I'd like to um, like you all to give a big thank you to our wonderful guest speakers tonight, our sign language interpreters and our captioners. Thanks everyone for taking part and thanks for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you sometime soon. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.